Well, I want to welcome everybody to our uh, program tonight. Uh, I'm Greg Kimball. I'm the Director of Public Services and Outreach here at the Library of Virginia. And um, I'm really delighted to be partnering uh, with the Jackson Project on this really, really wonderful uh, year-long celebration of the 150th anniversary of Jackson Ward. Um, I first met uh, C. Shamoon in the reading room at the Library of Virginia. Uh, she started with a really simple question, like who was Jackson? Uh, who was Jackson Ward named after? That's actually been kind of a mystery to historians over the years. And uh, she dug into that very deeply. Uh, had, I think probably has come to some pretty good conclusions on that. But like a lot of research projects, it started to really expand into all, some other really, very, really fascinating dimensions. And so they've explored, you know, the sessions have explored the history of the war, the future of the war, um, and also what, you know, what who should be commemorated in public spaces has been a key part of that. And that's certainly an important part of the uh, program that we're going to hear tonight. And I'm just looking forward to, to listening to our panelists and and learning more about some of these key figures from Jackson Ward's history. So I'm gonna now turn it over to Cisha Moon. Well, thank you, Greg. Um, it was a pleasure just to make your acquaintance uh, about six to eight months ago. Um, I'm Cisha Moon. I am one half of the Jackson Project. Um, unfortunately, my other half, who is my big sister, Anjali Moon, she cannot join us because she is actually preparing for the Africana Independent Film Festival, which this is a precursor kickoff to. So if you all don't have plans this weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, uh, the city of Richmond will be uh, highlighting Black narratives all weekend. So check out Africana Film Fest for more information. So, um, you know, today is the final lecture of a six part series that we've been doing all summer in partnership with Library of Virginia as well as Richmond Public Library. Uh, the first lecture really kicked off with who is Jackson and it explored uh, the research that me and my sister and Greg were all doing together to try to figure out who is the Jackson and Jackson Ward. Next, we followed up with a lecture on they tried to bury us where it was a metaphorical as well as literal discussion on black burial grounds in the city. Um, then we had walk the ward where we really talked about the intergenerational dynamics across the community um, having people um, ranging from Maggie L. Walker's descendants all the way up to Janice Allen and Carmen Flowers. Um, it was a really good discussion. Then we had a conversation about from gerrymander to gentrified and we talked about uh, the origins of this space and the full arc of Jackson Ward through a policy lens. And then our last um, session was about the Virginia way. And we had some key institutions across the state of Virginia come to the table about, you know, what was the Virginia way and then what is their commitment to kind of redefining a more equitable and just way forward for Virginia. And so this is our final one and it's called the rested and ready. And today we'll be, uh, you know, taking a deeper dive on the 15 honorary uh, ancestors that will have street signs unveiled for them on October 2nd um, as part of the Second Street Festival, as well as highlighting any additional shoulders that, that deserve to be considered a part of the Vanguard as well, because we understand that it's but so many streets in Jackson Ward, but many have left a legacy. Um, I will tell you, it's surreal that we had this entire program planned in May, and we knew that the street signs would go up around October, but we never knew that signs for 15 notable Jackson Wardians would go would start to be installed the day after Robert E. Lee would come down. And so when we talk about Jackson being an ancestrally guided project, because we didn't set out to do this as as Greg said, I was just in the library one day trying to figure out who is Jackson and Jackson Ward. We think that the timing is divine um, in a lot of ways. And so I want to just, before I introduce the panel, I want to tell you who these 15 streets are named after, um, what their designation name will be, and where they'll be located. And starting on October 2nd, if you follow the jacksonproject.com, it'll be more information on how you can do socially distant, self-guided tours um, to really interact with each of the signs. So first we have Abraham Peyton Skipwith. His street will be Abraham Skipwith Alley. It will be at the intersection of Judah Street and Lee Street. He is actually the anchoring ancestor of Jackson's research. He's the first black homeowner uh, within the ward. And so Jackson literally considers him the founding father of this space. Um, next, Bill Bojangles Robinson Boulevard. Um, that will be at Lee Street and Chamberlain Avenue. 
W.W. Brown Road will be at the intersection of Jackson Street and Chamberlain Avenue. John Jasper Way, um, he will be, this street will be elevated as part of the unveiling, but Six Mount Zion is actually responsible um, for uh, establishing this street designation, which is at the intersection of Duval Street and Chamberlain Avenue. Lily Estes Lane uh, at the intersection of Charity Street and St. James Street. Charles Gipling Crossing, Charity Street, and at the intersection of Charity Street and St. James Street, Lucy Goodbrook Square at the intersection of Charity Street and St. John Street. And we'd also like to give a major shout out to Lucy Goodbrooks and Friends Association for Children because just like Jackson Ward was celebrating you know, it's 150th anniversary, so is Friends. Uh, they were founded in 1871. Uh, Neverett Eggleston Plaza at the intersection of 2nd Street and Lee Street. 80 Price Avenue at the intersection of 3rd Street and Lee Street. John Mitchell Manor at the intersection of 3rd Street and Lee Street. Giles B. Jackson Walk at the intersection of 3rd Street and Clay Street. Oliver Hill Drive, 3rd Street and Marshall Street. Lorna Pinckney Place at the intersection of 2nd Street and Marshall Street. Rosa Dixon Bowser Branch at the um, intersection of East Clay Street and West Clay Street. And last but not least, Maggie Walker Way, which will be a full stretch from Adams Street and Broad, starting at her statue at the plaza, going all the way to the end of um, Broad Street where the Richmond Convention Center is. Um, so really that full stretch of what we know as the historic Jackson Ward District. Um, and so now it is with delight to mention who the panelists are and the moderator. You know, I had a conversation uh, recently with someone about shoulders and they said, well, I don't like when people say shoulders because it makes me feel old. And I said, I don't know if shoulders means your age or means when you come into the work. And when I look at the panelists and the moderator that we have today, we are standing on some significant shoulders that are willing tonight to give their energy and their expertise to this conversation. And first up, we have Brother Gary Flowers, who will be our moderator. He is a Richmond, Virginia native um, who graduated from the University of Virginia and read law at the Hill Tucker and Marsh Law Firm. He has been executive director of the Old Dominion Bar Association, special assistant to Governor L. Douglas Wilder, public policy analyst and coordinator of electoral observers for the 1994 elections in South Africa, vice president of programs and national field director for the Reverend Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Push Coalition and executive director and CEO of the Black Leadership Forum in Washington. He returned to Richmond in 2014 and became host of the Gary Flowers Show. And he now lives in Jackson Ward where he has become a community staple with Walk the World with Gary Flowers. Brother Flowers, Rue Dog Rue, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks so much. Hi. Next up, we have uh, Ms. Gina Rogers, who, who is a supervisory park ranger with the Maggie L. Walker National Historic Site, and she's been in this role since 2010. In this role, she manages day-to-day -day interpretive operations, program development, and community outreach. She has been a National Park Service interpreter since 1984, and during her career, she has worked at Blue Ridge Parkway, Booker T. Washington National Monument, Independence National Historical Park, and Valley Forge National Historic historical park. She's been featured by Richmond Times Dispatch, Richmond Free Press, C-SPAN, and most recently she was featured on Time Magazine's Beyond Greenwood, the historic legacies and overlooked stories of America's Black Wall Streets. Come on, Miss Agena. Thank you for being with us. I didn't realize that, but thank you. <laughs> you like how I put some little spedazzle on your bio. Like I did my research. <laughs> Next up, we have Omila De Janine Bell. Uh, beyond being my soror, she is founder and president of Alegba Folklore Society, uh, which is a cultural center that makes an educational, social, and economic and spiritual impact. She created and produces the society's annual events, including Juneteenth, a freedom celebration, this past weekend's Down Home Family Reunion, a celebration of African American folk life, and the Capital City Kwanzaa Festival. The society also offers a menu of of cultural historical tours and presents performances of African dance, music, theater. Uh, Sora Bell holds a degree from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and is a recipient of the university's Harvey E. Beach Outstanding Alumni Award, the Teresa Pollock Prize for Excellence in Arts, the Bell Women in Arts Award, the 2019 Richmond History Maker Award, and recognition as 2020 Person of the Year by Richmond Times Dispatch. And when I say Sora, she's a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And, you know, I just want to give you your flowers Ooh, because 
we understand that Juneteenth became a national holiday this year. However, you've been holding space for that story well before it became popular. And so thank you. Just want to give you your flowers. Thank you, my dear. You're welcome. And last but not least, we have Mary Lauderdale from the Black History Museum. Uh, so Mary moved to Richmond, Virginia from Philly in 1995. She first learned about the Black History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia through the news, and she went to become a volunteer. And 20 years later, here she is tonight offering her expertise um, as a critical worker at the Black History Museum. Um, in this role, she's worked in the frontline staff. She's been a chief docent, visitor, and volunteer services. She's been a gift shop manager, operations manager. And in her role, at the museum, she actually became a founding member of the Sisters of Yam. Am I saying that right? Mm -hmm. All right. And African American Quilters Guild. Um, it's a pleasure to have you. You know, Black History Museum uh, is a staple in the community. And I think that if we could dedicate tonight to anybody, it would be to Adele Johnson. And so hopefully her spirit is with, her, with us as she too has joined the ancestors. And so Mary, it's a pleasure to have you. Tonight's about to be fantastic. Brother Flowers, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. C. Shamoon. And in her absence, uh, your sister Anjali. Nature holds that everything comes when it's supposed to come. And the history of, of Jackson Ward has been suppressed by the Virginia Way. Uh, it has been obfuscated by the media. Uh, and in some ways, it has been ignored by those who should pay attention. And so here we are in 2021, which marks the 150th year of historic Jackson Ward. And by your work as a fastidious researcher and by your sister's work as a visionary, you have, the two of you have been able to bring together and connect the dots on a lot of work that's been done before you, and that's when you talk about shoulders. And so we first pay homage to those who have come before us. Uh, for example, Mrs. Magdalena Walker, the word on the street was that she should have a statue in, two, in 1936, two years after her death. We didn't get the statue until 2017, but there were a lot of people who worked on that in between. And so we wanna thank you for bringing the baton across uh, at least the finish line of a new beginning. And the new beginning will be not only street names, but a new interpretation and a reinterpretation of history that's always been there. It's been the Virginia way that just hid it from everyone else. And so thank you for the work that you and your sister Anjali have done. So I'm glad to be here tonight. People ask me uh, on the beginning of my tours, walking the ward with Gary Flowers, you know, what, what, what brought you here? And it is the transmutation of facts that otherwise were hidden. And so we always say you can't give off heat if you're not on fire. And so I'm on fire and I'm glad to be with an esteemed panelist uh, tonight. And uh, I wanna begin with uh, looking, uh, and I wanna direct this to, to Sister Janine. When we look at the African origins of civilization and how Africans were brought to this place called North America uh, and later called Virginia. Uh, mm -hmm. What were the predicates uh, that you saw uh, in, in coming to where we are today and recognizing Jackson Ward culturally and uh, uh, from a, a really a pain and, and, and triumph of pain perspective? Well, that's an interesting question, Gary, and thank you for asking it, because as I was thinking about tonight's program, really Jackson Ward as it existed in its heyday and the Jackson Ward that we are remembering and hopefully renewing um, is just exemplary in my estimation of so many aspects of the interdependence and self-determination that we see in African societies. Um, it was in uh, Virginia's terms segregated from the bigger culture, but it was insulated into itself 
And so people, it was the practice of uh, what the Zulus call Ubuntu. I am because we are, and we are because I am. And so everything that happened inside the ward was facing inward towards each other. We talk uh, in terms of the vanguard, we talk of course about the luminaries, but there were so many people who stood in rank, who knew their part, who like my mother used to say to me, do your part and every bit of it, who practiced those roles that we see in African societies that are social, that are economic, that are business, that are family, and that are honorable, that, that sought the highest good. And so when you think now about Jackson Ward being recognized as little Africa in the 1700s and the kinds of excellence that was exhibited there, that is exhibited there uh, even now by newer generations, I think it's a testament to uh, our Africanness and the African presence in what became the capital of the Virginia and Virginia, of course, as the first recorded place of the African presence in America. And as a segue, in many respects, the Commonwealth of Virginia, the Commonwealth of the Confederacy is ground zero to the American empire, pretty much for all of the wrong reasons. The tyranny Absolutely. of wealth. The tyranny Absolutely. Of wealth. Yeah, the tyranny of wealth. The, mm -hmm. the idea that people's culture could be redirected toward a Eurocentric value base. Uh, the idea that names from Angola of the first 20 Africans would be changed to the name of the governor of the colony in, in 1619 by the last name of Tucker. And so in many respects, the Commonwealth of Virginia has led the way in what not to do uh, in terms of honor, justice, and equity. And when you talk about values, let's segue to the values of Jackson Ward. I think no other person exemplifies the values of Jackson Ward than Mrs. Maggie Lena Walker. The idea of self-determination, entrepreneurship, race pride, the idea of dignity over dollars, but then using dollars to make sense for not only her family, but the community and the nation. The idea that there is a, 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 a common connection between entrepreneurship and business development and political enfranchisement. The idea that we, when we fight together, we win. And so uh, when I look at, at Gina Rogers uh, as the, the superintendent ranger of the Maggie Walker House, You've studied Mrs. Walker and her values. Please share with our listening and viewing audience tonight, what are those values and how did they help to form what we know as historic Jackson Ward? Well, those values, those values of Jackson Ward are pretty well captured in Maggie Walker's generation. And I will also say they were passed along from Maggie Walker to the next generation and picked up by the current people who are, are here in Jackson Ward. Because I would say that you know the National Park Service being here for the last 40 years, uh, we have learned and, and studied Maggie Walker's way, if you want it, considering the, the name of the street is coming up as, as Maggie Walker way. Uh, it, it gives you the idea of how to pull together in, in the face of adversity. Uh, when your voice is squelched or silenced, you don't just cross your arms and say, mm, there's nothing I can do about that. Maggie Walker's generation, who, that first generation coming out of slavery without having experienced slavery as a day-to-day -day existence, they were learning from those who came before them. 
and pulled it together to say, come at, in unity, come with the idea of how you're going to collectively uplift all and make sure that you pass those values on to the next generation. So when I think about Maggie Walker being in the vanguard of, of, of Jackson Ward and the values of community uplift, I know that it can apply to those who are living there now. How do we uh, bring these things together? Because the, the adversity, the, the obstacles didn't stop and they won't stop. We have to use those tools and draw on it. Uh, and now the community is more diverse. The people who are living in Jackson Ward, it's not a predominantly black uh, um, neighborhood anymore. But does that mean that we uh, just turn away from what it used to be? Or do we draw it and learn from it? That's why this is important to, to look at the vanguards. So we can get and write down those lessons and pull together with the neighbors that are currently there now. It's a community and that, that's what you learn from it. Those values can still be passed along. When you talk about values uh, transmuted to institutions, uh, Mary Lauderdale, you represent the Black History Museum uh, and Cultural Center of Virginia. And first and foremost, once again, our condolences and our memory go out to uh, Sister Adele Johnson, may she rest in paradise and peace, but what is the role of institutions, albeit the Black History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia, or museums or, or, and other institutions around the state and around the country in not only preserving, but enhancing what Jackson Ward stands for, not only for Richmond and Virginia, but the nation and the world. So um, the most simple way to talk about the Black History Museum is to first, uh, uh, to condense our mission, our mission is to preserve stories that inspire. And uh, each of the stories that we tell about each of the individuals on this list and others are um, inspirations to everybody. The values, the, um, the um, idea of being artists and being uh, entrepreneurs, bankers, business people, from hairdressers to uh, barbers and the like, for us to tell those stories um, is, is paramount. Um, even the, um, the more modern day people that we, tell, we are starting to tell the stories of and going into the future, what we will talk about those folks that we have recently lost. Um, and it doesn't matter how young, how old they were, folks such as uh, Adele Johnson, um, Lorna Pickney, um, Lily uh, are just as um, important to talk about their stories as, uh, as Lucy Wood Brooks, as John Mitchell Jr., as uh, Maggie Walker. Um, and our role is to bring out more of those undertold stories to inspire. Absolutely, and, and it's not lost to us that the building itself, the armory, the former Lee Street Armory was constructed by Mrs. Walker's husband. Armstead Walker, yes. Armstead Walker, and those bricks not only give a physical foundation and give a visual symbol uh, of an edifice that represents Jackson Ward, but it now houses the stories that will come forward on how we, we, we tell the story. And so uh, I wanna segue from there to when we commemorate names of streets, you know, some would say, why would you keep the, the, the green sign and not just replace it with another sign? What is the value of putting both together as we now start to rename streets and institutions within Jackson Ward, for those who built it in a sense of collaboration and not for those whose names represented the same thing that the Confederate statues represented, a reminder 
to not only black men who had the franchise in 1870, at the founding in 1871 of Jackson Ward, named after Confederate. So what is the power of names, Sister Janine? Well, <laughs> uh, going back again to various African societies, names give us a blueprint for how we live life. Names give us um, a life path. So it's important to, you know, Richmond is, a, Richmond is an interestingly historical place. And of course, quite a bit of the history that this conversation uh, stems from is the history that's hidden in plain sight. So I think that it creates an interesting dichotomy for learning uh, and similarly on Monument Avenue to be able to know what the namers thought was significant and then to come back and say, but here's a whole uh, truth of a whole people that was blindsided in that naming. The new names will illuminate uh, lives and contributions and trials and tribulations that most people don't know. And I find that whether people, whatever ethnic group people come from, there's an aha moment that they can have about where they are. Um, we get blindsided because we only know what's been taught in our schools uh, and we think that's the whole story. So it will raise, I think, curiosity. I mean, first of all, a lot of times people don't really think about, well, well who was Lee? Well, who was Clay? Well, who was Marshall? Anyway, it's just where I gotta go. But now exactly. with, uh, with the new names, maybe there can be uh, some conversation that happens um, that as has been asserted earlier in this dialogue can help to make Richmond uh, a richer place. You said yourself, Gary, about how Virginia set forth the evolution of a nation. And so we all know that our elders uh, have said folklorically, but also maybe metaphysically, that we got to go out the way we came in. And so if we can get some things repositioned and turned up the right way here in Richmond, which became the capital of it all, then maybe we can set forth a different way in the nation. I think that's very well put. And, and, and just on one one piece of, of what I said, I said that Virginia was ground zero for the American empire. And if we were a nation, that we would be a nation of nationals. If black people received their citizenship in 1868, we would be nationals and we would be part of the nation. But an empire goes out to conquer and to conquest and to rape, pillage and pl plunder for the sake of the empire. And so, even the language of how the nation was founded has to be reinterpreted. But I'll give credit once again to the, to the Moon Sisters because when, when Dr. Cisha first introduced it, she said, you know, Brother Flowers, it's important that we under the name of Duvall put skip with because it begs the question, well, who was Duvall? Right, exactly, then, right, exactly. Yes, and then who then is skip with? Who was Lee, and then who is Mrs. Walker? Uh, and so, uh, with with that, it, it is so important that we not only know the names, but know the context of the names. And and I, I think that's important. And so, um, and so, because so, if I can say, Gary, yeah, I was going to come to you now, please. And, yeah, because when those names were put on by the people who named these streets, they were put on with a purpose. Yes, but as time progressed those names lost the meaning. They did became, just like you said, Janine, 
places or, or Gary, places to how I'm going to get there to Duval and Chamberlain or, um, or uh, Jackson and Calhoun, which end up being say Stonewall Jackson perhaps and John C. Calhoun. But back in the time of the Confederacy, these were leading um, slavery proponents. But now it's just the intersection where the Calhoun Center is. And where you, so, where so you go gotta, to- I'm sorry. Yeah, please. No, go, go right ahead. Well, we gotta get people to start thinking again, yes. because we kind of get robotic sometimes and we don't really think about where mm -hmm. we are. And we don't really yeah, think yeah. about who we are in the where we are and what our role is now yeah. and going forward. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, it, the, well the great philosopher, the, the great philosopher George Clinton said, free your mind <laughs> and the rest will follow. You know the rest. <laughs> there we go, there we go. And so, and so when we look at Sister Mary, once again, from an institutional standpoint, uh, what are the plans of the Black History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia going forward on how we enhance the knowledge of not only street names, but reinterpreting the misinterpretation of our beloved ward? Wow. Um, well, uh, wow. That's, that's an interesting question. It, uh, uh, I almost feel sometimes that we're converting people, you know how they say we save the world one cat at a time or something like that. People say things like that. I feel uh, many times um, it's, it's definitely an uphill battle. Um, I think that the black history in Virginia, in Richmond, in um, and the Black History Museum are unfortunately well-kept secrets. As much as people know about us, there is so much more um, that has not been told. Um, Jackson Ward is a unique story. It is, it is a story that is um, something that should be broadcast around the world, first of all, in, in my opinion. Um, and I think the Black History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia is uh, a place, a nucleus to start to uh, spread that story. Um, a place where people can come and learn, but also um, a safe space to talk about this history and to expand upon this history and to explain, or I won't say explain, people should know this, but understand that black history is American history. It is not just for black people. This country would not be what it is if it wasn't for the African American contribution to um, the story. Um, I find it interesting that um, it's starting to change a little bit, but you know, growing up, we all read stories that might um, start out the first books that we get might feature uh, uh, a child that is not African-American, um, usually a young white child playing ball, uh, having a game that's going to school, has a dog or whatever. But if you just insert a black face there, it's the same story. And I don't think people understand that um, blacks, the black experience, uh, life is life, life is life. Um, and we all share pain, hurt, hope. Um, we are artistic, we are, enterprising people and um, Black History Museum is the place to tell more of these stories. You know, as we go forward, looking at, I mean, the, the Moon Sisters have, have labeled it unveiling a vanguard. And a vanguard, of course, is a, is a new way of thinking. There will be people and institutions who will say, well, yeah, I understand those are the 15 names you've chosen, but what about 16, 17, 37, 82? What are some of the names that you may want to put forward tonight, and this is open to the panel, uh, that we may have left out that should be included in at least the next round? And as you want to, please, please comment. Well, you know, I, 
thought about a couple of people and I have to say, uh, looking at my co-panelists, I regret that the people I didn't think about were women. So Agina and Mary, we got to get that together, right? Yes, we but, do. <laughs> <laughs> but I did think about, um, of course, John Langford, uh, architect John Langford. Um, he was the first professionally licensed African-American architect in Virginia in 1922. Uh, some of his uh, buildings are in Jackson Ward right now. Uh, the mansion, the Taylor Mansion beside the uh, um, Hippodrome Theater over there. And then also the Southern Aid. Uh, society building that was built in 1908. There are, there are so many buildings that are in the permanent uh, streetscape that were designed by Black people that we don't know. Uh, and so in terms of someone who collected some of these structures, Mr. Stallings, yes. he had the foresight to do that. To, and that's a preservation, that's preservation. We don't, as African-Americans, always think about preservation. It's kind of like how we don't always think about investment, but you know, those kinds of things have to change. And maybe even the, the dichotomy of these street signs may lead to those kinds of deeper conversations. I think about Waverly Crawley, the mayor of Second Street. Uh, and then I think about sometimes the people who weren't necessarily the leaders and movers and shakers, but the people who supported those people. Yes. The, the shoe shiners, the shopkeepers, the resistors, who tailored and designed Maggie Walker's clothes. I mean, you know what I mean? Yes. There are all kinds of stories that are interwoven that create a whole- If I may add, the unsung heroes and sheroes. Correct. There you go. Uh, and, and I may add, uh, to that, when we, when we look at Dr. Zenobia Gilpin, mm -hmm. you know, people don't call her name as being a black female physician uh, in, in Jackson Ward. And B Mr. Binga, for whom the Binga Center was named, uh, are, are, are just a few. But, and I'll, I'll throw this to, to Mary. Uh, I've suggested even before her, her, her death uh, that we have a memorial walkway in front of the Black History Museum behind the goalpost in Abner Clay Park hmm. with paver bricks hmm. of individuals and institutions that helped to make Jackson Ward historic Jackson Ward. And there could be small benches like we have at the Mrs. Maggie Walker statue that have either uh, reliefs on the side or at least quotes when we talk about institutional knowledge of Jackson Ward, the wisdom, the collective wisdom that came out of Jackson Ward can be put forth in, in small benches and the organizations. When we have the Renaissance Roll Call at the Second Street Festival, there were 122 organizations represented last year. Who wow. are descendants of the Tents and the Knights of Pythias? and the Theban Beneficial Club and the Astoria Beneficial Club. And so uh, if you would, Sister Mary, you know, bring it to your leadership that we honor Adele Johnson by way of a memorial parkway or path that has paver bricks uh, behind the goalposts in Abner Clay Park. What say you? I made, I made a big note about that, but just to go back a second, the one thing I did want to say uh, was, you know, we we're talking about who else we can name these streets after. Yes. I think, and I think that um, um, he placed us, persons such as what we are today, just to understand that each of these stories we tell, each of these streets that we name, for everyone we name, there's, you know, 20 other people that we named, they could have been named after. And it's not always the famous or the names that uh, everyone hears about, but this is to pique people's interest to learn more on their own, not just to, uh, you know, not just for these names eventually become like the names that are up there now. Nobody knows why they're named after that. It's for us to keep these stories alive daily. 
And I, I would want to add to that too, because it made me think the who is doing this work now and remember, and for us to remember how Jackson Ward was split into two. Yeah. So we're constantly talking about historic Jackson Ward, but when you think over to on the other side where the St. Luke Hall is now and where Gilpin Court is now, there are people who are doing great things over there. Uh, so uh, the documentary, Heard. Yes. I hope everyone has a chance to see that documentary, those who've come up in public housing and what they are doing to, to, to advance the communities there. And TJ Thompson, I would call his name out now because he is uh, doing what he can to uplift himself and those who are right around him. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, we, we can't name, we have a limited number of streets, but an unlimited number of stories that we need to tell. So we, and I have 150 years to cover with them. So let's start, let's start doing it. Let's start telling it. They're, we're the vanguard, they're the vanguard. We got to push this forward and get the narrative out about what Absolutely. is happening now. And looking at the uh, chat room, uh, I failed to mention Mrs. Ethel Bailey Berman. Uh, the, uh, I was trying to remember yes. her name. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And uh, the, the other heroes and sheroes, as we remember their names, we remember their contributions and we teach uh, succeeding generations in granite and in brick uh, and in stone and in bronze. And that's what makes Mrs. Walker's statue at Adams and Broad Street so uh, important. Um, but as we go forward, we have to recommit. What are your thoughts about how we trans let me, let me go back. One of the reasons that the Confederate statues became so prominent because of the fastidious work, albeit misguided and you know, immoral and ungodly uh, and un-American, but the daughters and sons of the Confederacy helped to rewrite the history books to give honor and prestige to traitors to the United States of America. That was the ugly. We have a chance now to interface with government at the local, county, and state level. What would your suggestions be on how we change the curriculum to better emphasize the, the values and the contributions and life and legacies of Jackson Ward and now historic Jackson Ward? And either one of you can answer. Well, I'll start. I, I, I'll say, uh, and I'll, then I'll let you finish. Okay. <laughs> There's just a pregnant pause there. I don't, I yeah, don't like dead yeah. air. Right. No, no, because I, I was thinking about what we do here at the Maggie L. Walker National Historic Site, and, and that is part of it. And we're working within the standards of learning for Virginia to bring this part of this, these parts of the story out for, to give teachers something to add to what the the narrative is or what the curriculum is. I, I'm looking back at my education as a, you know, when I was in fourth grade, we had that horrible Virginia history book. Yet my teachers took that and black and white teachers added to it and still gave us the proper things to, to learn, gave us the full story. And it comes down to institutions like us and the teachers and the parents to come together to tell all of this. And it also will help us build on to, so we have the core story of Jackson Ward, but Frederick Douglass Court grew out of Jackson Ward when people moved out. And, and, and Randolph, as people expanded into and out of Jackson Ward, these things were coming around the, the rest of the city of Richmond and going across the world going across the country. So we can tell those stories and add to the curriculum that's currently there. I agree. Uh, I agree with you, Gina. You know, uh, in some of the uh, cultural history tours that we offer here at the Alegba Folklore Society, particularly the uh, in the beginning, Virginia. I love that Along one. the trail of enslaved Africans. Sometimes we get uh, large groups of college students who will come. And we think that it's important to start our story 
where it starts as opposed to when we're on our knees in enslavement. So we talk about Africa's contributions to world development and yes. even the collegiates, sometimes they would tell, they would call me a liar. That can't be true. All the greatness and grandeur um, that shaped the world that we talk about, that can't be true. You must it not have it right. How can you know? Who told you those things? And I'm saying in education, the antithesis of the Daughters of the Confederacy's indoctrination is so that we as African descended people can see ourselves. Yes. How can we even fathom greatness if the only examples we see are outside of ourselves yes, yes we don't believe that we can rise above it's like uh the conditioning of pavlov's dog or the flea in the box or whatever we don't we don't descend any higher but we are the creators and originators of the highest yeah. height and, and that's we that's well said the education process that said, uh, let us go to uh, the, the audience, the viewing audience and listening audience uh, for questions. Uh, you, we just covered the one, uh, we had a question that dealt with Frederick Douglass Court. And I must say, I'm a proud grandson of Frederick Douglass Court. My grandfather built uh, my uh, father's family's house in 1927, partly because of the largesse and the vision of Mrs. Maggie Walker and Judge Spotswood Robinson's father, who founded from the bank a realty company and established the first black subdivision in Richmond. Um, let's, uh, let's go to Sister Annie. Several significant changes were legislated last year into K through 12 history standards uh, that have already been integrated into local school divisions. This year, there is a full high school course offered across the state for all history standards that are being reviewed. So we're making progress. Teacher training will also require African-American history course of all educators. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up, Sister Annie. And I, I may add that I, I worked with Brother Derek Vance at, his, at Henrico High School. And he has a class entitled Classroom to Community. It's the first African-American history course offered in Enrico schools as an elective. And he's now working with other history professors to make it more uniform. And this is part of what Sister Annie uh, says. Anybody want to comment on Sister Annie's point? Uh, Brother Greg? Yeah, I think it's incredibly important uh, to uh, integrate that. And I'll echo something that Mary said. Uh, you know, th this is American history. Um, there's nothing wrong with, with having two tracks and having strictly an African-American uh, course because many of these stories people simply don't know. Uh, but I think it's also important to recognize that um, African-Americans are central to the American story. I think the 1619 project really was about that. Uh, you know, placing them in a central role, not just as something peripheral to add on to American history. So. Both are needed, and uh, I know there are people, teachers doing incredibly good work on this. And can I chime in? Um, first of all, fantastic conversation. <laughs> um, I have a long list of things I want to say, so I'll try to keep it quick. Um, you know, our last lecture featured uh, Professor Is, who has the Real Richmond uh, curriculum with Real with Richmond Public Schools. So I just want to shout him out as well. Um, a couple of things, you know, when we think about Jackson and our decision as, as um, those on the phone know, because we, we consulted with them first. I mean, you guys were the first people to even recognize that this was about to become a project. And the intersection of the street names was very intentional because the truth is me and Angelita didn't know who Lee was. You know, we didn't know who Judah was. And so not to say that the intention 10 or 15 years from now isn't to, to dismantle those names, but we almost do the concept of whiteness a favor when we erase it without educating ourselves first. And so we hope that this is at least the first step in helping people to recognize the true origins of this space, including us. We've been learning along with the community. Um, but with that, there, I loved, uh, Miss Agina, you said there are a limited number of streets to tell unlimited amount of stories. Because I think that was so brilliant because not only 
do we need to capture individuals, but we need to capture ideas and institutions. So much came out of what is Jackson Ward. And so a couple of things, please visit our website. There is a link right now for Share More Shoulders where you can provide your recommendations on how to honor all of those limitless individuals, institutions, and ideas through installation. Um, but also Jackson, we hope this is just the start. We did 15, but what this shows is that any of us can go to the city and say, hey, I want for this corridor to be named after this person because they had a significant value. And so we hope that if anything, people feel a sense of pride and ownership and agency to do their own mini Jacksons um, across the city. And I think that the last thing that I really wanna say is, my father's August Moon. Some people who are from Richmond, Richmond know who he is. Sure. Um, and my mom's family's from Bird Park. We were proud to be black and it was from a lens of education. While what I learned in school, I mean, I went to John B. Carey, I, I, you know, in hindsight, what did I expect to learn from a school that's named after a Confederate soldier? Um, but my parents made sure that when I got home, they supplemented what was or was not taught in the classroom. And while we look at institutions like Alegba, like Walk the Ward, like Black History Museum, and like Maggie Walker House, who have been strategic partners for Jackson, we've also partnered with institutions that you wouldn't think, like Library of Virginia, Richmond Times Dispatch. And so when I think about even the partnership with Greg and LVA, it's also important for these institutions to be diverse and inclusive and equitable so that we can also come and learn our own truths in our own spare time outside of Monday through Friday from nine to three. And so if you are a part of institution, I feel like everyone has a commitment to redefine a new way for Virginia and Richmond, because we really are ground zero for a lot of the Black American experience. And so thanks for letting me get on my soapbox. I'm done. <laughs> um, and I just, I just wanted to say something too, you know, renaming streets. Uh, I walked along yesterday, just yesterday, walked along the Lee Street Viaduct, whatever you want to call it, uh, the Lee Street Bridge. And the tiny little sign that it was renamed the Martin Luther King Bridge Friday is 45 years since that was done. But how many people call it that? How many people think about what that bridge is? And I would just, um, we have to be stewards for renaming, when we rename these streets to keep the stories alive so that it doesn't just kind of like, you know, revert back to, oh yeah, we just call it that because, you know. Whatever. Oh no, walking the ward with Gary Flowers, we'll, we'll, we will walk past <laughs> the streets. Don't you worry. <laughs> But Mary, I think that's a good point because we also have to change our lexicon. I'm no longer making a right on Lee Street. I'm making a right on Bull Bojangles Boulevard. That's right. Like it has become a part of our everyday. Right. And, and for like Google Maps to recognize it. That's another thing. So when I go to the Harlem of the North from the Harlem of the South, <laughs> I just feel so proud seeing across the big intersections, uh, Malcolm X Boulevard, or um, even some of the little signs, Wyatt T. Walker Way or Zora Neale Hurston Way, uh, uh, at, um, Adam Clayton Powell, uh, just all the names, I'm not gonna go down the list. But it gives me in those spaces a sense of belonging, yes. a sense of my work is intertwined with this work, with your ancestral work, that somehow you've passed the baton on to me and now I've taken it to do my work. And I think that that will be helpful here in Richmond as well to say, I do matter. This work matters. Or as you mentioned, Agena, for the new neighbors in Jackson Ward, to really be clear about where you live and, and how this area has shaped what Richmond and what Virginia is, and to also be a call to action keep for them. Going. Yeah, keep it going. Absolutely. Uh, as we begin to close, I'm looking at uh, Facebook and, and some of the questions have been answered already, but one was where, where would visitors go 
to get the videos of previous uh, previous lectures. And I think that's been answered. Uh, this is from Sister Christy. This is an incredible opportunity and so glad to support it. Thank you all. Great panel, great discussion. Congratulations to the Moon Sisters. You are incredible, I will agree. Thank you, thank you. And so that's Krista from the Maimon Foundation. Yeah. We're looking at the intersection uh, with Sister Krista of those who labored in the Dooley Mansion, many of whom lived in Jackson Ward. Jackson Ward. Yeah. And so we are mapping now that house addresses, some of which were taken by the Interstate 95, but to the extent that we know where they were, let me say it this way, we are the consummate of all whose memory we cherish. And so whether it's a street name or whether it's a brick in the road or whether it is Google Maps, as we call their names, then we become part of, part of them become part of us and, and it lives. And so I, I'm so glad that we had this opportunity uh, tonight to have the discussion. Uh, Dr. Cisha or Greg, do you have any uh, further thoughts? I just want to thank all the panelists. It's been a fantastic conversation. And, you know, the work is, is just ongoing. And it is. There's so many other names we could add. Um, I'll put a little plug in for the library and the Capitol. We've just getting ready to complete um, all of the biographies of uh, the men who served in the General Assembly from Reconstruction to the around 1900. And there's a lot more than people think. There are just so many of these kinds of stories that need to get out there. And, and so our work is cut out for us, but everyone who's been on this, uh, on this panel has obviously contributed tremendously to that. And um, we just hope we can contribute to it as well here at the library. And uh, please come and see us. We'd love to work with you as we've been working with the Moon Sisters. Uh, for me, you know, one, just thank you everyone, you know, just for believing in this work, being the shoulders that we've been standing on to even do this work. Um, and I think, you know, I guess a couple of plugs. I think the first is that, you know, we wanted to have this, you know, a lot of pomp and circumstance around the unveilings. But unfortunately, you know, we really had to make the difficult decision that we just could not do that safely when thinking about the descendants, uh, many of whom identifies at risk. So we've had to pivot it to virtual. So on October 2nd, you'll have more information by way of a video and instructions on how to engage with the street signs on your own. And hopefully when this pandemic passes, we can still revisit a proper unveiling um, ceremony. But I hope that the, you know, just on behalf of me and Anjali, we hope that the community understands that we just had to make a tough call. On but that. Dr. Cisha, if, if I may add from my beginning and opening statements, everything comes in due season. And perhaps it is the divine's idea that we don't have a lot of pomp and circumstance for the initial unveiling of the streets, but that when we approach it again, perhaps in April for the Jackson Ward Day, we have more of a foundation upon which to build. And so don't consider the deficiency, it's just a redirection, but the street names will be there. And see, Come on, Brother Flowers. I like how you're thinking about this thing. Okay. Right. Right. <laughs> it, it was it was it's sad, but it but it but today seeing the first of the signs go up was was in you know it felt empowering. So be on the lookout October 2nd. Um also be on the lookout for us in Library of Virginia. We are in Maggie Walker House. We are taking a deeper dive on Abraham Peyton Skipwith. Um, as we said, he is the anchoring ancestor for Jackson's research. And we have some great things in the pipeline um, as it relates to him because we want for Abraham Skipwith to be a, a known name just like Maggie Walker throughout the community and throughout the country. Um, and does anybody else have any plugs before we say good night? Uh, Omilade, anything coming up at Elegba Folklore that we should know about? Well, yes, we uh, offer monthly tours. I mentioned earlier in the beginning, Virginia, along the trail of enslaved Africans, which is certainly a foundational step to that leads us to Jackson Ward. And we do these uh, for groups by reservation, but we also open it to the public once a month. And so Saturday, September 25th, 
is the next time that you can join us. We'll start at noon here at the Elegba Folklore Society's Cultural Center. And you can visit our website and learn more. Or if you old school out there, you can just call us 644-3900, 804-644-3900. All right, Maggie Walker House, what you all got? All right, well, I just wanna make sure everybody knows how to come and visit us. Uh, we're open Tuesday through Saturday and we have, uh, the house has reopened, but it's by reservation and we take family, uh, one group at a time through COVID safety protocols. And so either on the phone or on our website, sign up for one of those four tours that we have throughout. Um, and we'll be having a presence on the corner of second and, well, I was gonna, I'm still gonna say second and Lee Street because Mrs. Walker said Lee Street. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, during the Second Street Festival. So we'll be there and be happy to see anyone who's able to come out for that. So, yep, go to our website and find out the rest. All right, Black History Museum and Cultural Center, Virginia. So look for information on our newest exhibition coming up. It's titled, Unsay Their Names, Stop the Pain. And it's an exhibition of photographs of and quilts of events that have happened in the past year and a half pertaining to COVID, uh, the statues, uh, Black Lives Matter, and um, um, it's gonna be a fantastic exhibition. I also wanna say we are doing a joint exhibition with the Holocaust Museum and the History and Culture Museum that is up through October 24th. And that is titled Violins of Hope. And, it and ours features five violins from Holocaust victims. And this is showing solidarity um, Race, creed, color, music is important to everyone. Hope and pain transcends uh, race. And so, um, oh, it's a great exhibition, very moving. And I also wanna say, I have my uh, Lucy Good Brooks bracelet. I wore it tonight, I wear it every single day. She says, isn't it amazing what one woman can do with the help of their, her friends? And I say, what well, is it amazing what we can do with the help of our friends and everybody here is friends and we just have to keep moving forward. Yes, ma'am. And Gary Flowers, how can people hear you, walk with you and all that good stuff? Well, by day you may uh, hear me or view me on the Gary Flowers show, uh, which is rejoicerichmond.com. Uh, but you may walk with me on Mondays, Wednesdays, Saturdays and Sundays and book your tours through walkingtheward.com. But more than that, on the Saturday after Thanksgiving, I'm working with Tiger Tom Mitchell's great, great nephew, Kerry Mitchell. And he has brought together a great vision to, to celebrate and to consecrate the life and legacy of the Armstrong Walker classic by way of a parade that will trans uh, uh, the historic Jackson Ward from essentially the Coliseum, Fifth and Lee, to the Maggie Walker High School. And so it's, an, it's a way that we don't, you don't have to be a graduate of Armstrong or Walker High School. It's a way that we can talk about the values of the game and institutional memory. And so we look forward to you joining us the Saturday after Thanksgiving. You'll hear more in the coming weeks. Greg, you know, final thing to you, for Library of Virginia all summer to share your platform, to yeah, so um, of course we, we are dedicated to the history of, of Virginia writ large, and we have a great exhibit right now on Columbia Pike, which is probably the most diverse several miles in the United States. There are over a hundred different cultures represented there. Uh, mm -hmm. This was a photography project that documented the various uh, festivals and other things that happened along the pike. Uh, I think it's a great, great uh, exhibit. We'd love to have you come see it. And, and just as you have, Cisha, we just encourage people to come and do research with us. Um, we are going to be reopening some Saturday hours. So check the library's website. Um, because of COVID, we had a more limited schedule, but we want to reopen that so that we can get more people who may not be able to attend during the week to uh, come in. And, um, you know, I think sometimes people get intimidated by... Uh, you know, coming into an archives, and I can understand that. But um, we, we can train you up and get you get you into the original material and the real stuff. 
you know, you, you'll learn the real history of Virginia by reading the original documents. I've always said that. Yes. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Everybody take care, stay safe, and uh, hopefully we'll see you online on October 2nd, okay? Right. Good evening. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.